All right, we're broadcasting live. So I was just telling the panelists, now we're broadcasting live. So anything they say, we can hear it. Everybody can hear it and, and they'll be put on, they'll be called on it later. Uh, but again, this is, um, I say it every time, this is my favorite time because the participant number and the attending number, you just kind of see like rolling over as everyone gets let into the webinar. Um, and even though I can't see their faces, it's great to see names of people that I haven't seen in six months. And by this time of the year, should have seen like four or five times with all of the events that we normally are going to. Um, so welcome guys. Alfredo Gonzalez, as always, it's great to see your name. And we both live in Florida and we haven't seen each other. We just live on opposite sides of the state. Um, as always, as you are logging in and we're waiting for everyone to, to get into the call, let us know where you're coming in from. Um, chat us um, and, and tell us what's going on with you. Um, these are, um, as everyone that is continuing to log in knows, these are um, really laid back webinars where we can have a good conversation about what's happening in the industry and check in with some of our tour operator friends and our panelists today that uh, it's uh, very unique um, that not shouldn't be unique. That, I mean, that's the wrong word. It shouldn't be unique. We have strong, independent, powerful, empowered women who work in these companies and own these companies. So it's going to be a really great conversation um, today with that. Um, and, and we all all of our panelists are working in different markets, so it's uh, going to be a lot of fun to uh, to see and hear what's going on with them. Uh -huh. All over, Chicago's in the house, and California's in the house. New Jersey, Bob from New Jersey, good to see you, Bob. Uh -huh. Love to see all of these names coming in, and thank you for continuing to to tune in with us week after week. Um, this is my favorite part of the week because it's it's seriously like connecting with friends. You know, we're we're just having a having a conversation, and it makes me feel like we're together. Um, but this week, uh, you know, for the last couple of weeks, we've been we've been talking about domestic, um, and we're doing that for a reason because everything we see is that domestic is going to come back first. Um, so we want to make sure that we are we are engaged in the domestic market, and we have all the information that we can. Um, and, and figure out how we kind of work together to get through recovery. Um, before we get into our conversation, as always, I wanna thank Betsy Cooper from Tour Operator Land because Tour Operator Land is sponsoring all of our webinars and has been since the end of March um, and continues to do so. So we appreciate that and we appreciate her. If you're not engaged with Tour Operator Land, reach out to Betsy and learn a little bit more about it because it's a great way to get royalty-free photos and, and itineraries and ideas of, of what you should be doing or what you can do in, in destinations all over the U.S. and Canada. Um, so with that said, um, I want to get started um, on this conversation because it's going to be a great one. Um, we have you know practice calls just to make sure that, that all of our audio is working and the video is facing the right way. Um, and, and it was fun. So this is gonna be a great, a great hour. Um, um, if you could, uh, please put any questions in the Q&A. Um, that is much easier for us to get to and have them all in one place. Um, but if you're more comfortable with chat, that's fine, that's fine too, we'll find it. Um, so we can get the question answered. Um, so I'm gonna start by letting the panelists introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what their company focuses on. And we're going to start with Julie. Welcome. Okay, Julie. great. Number one. <laughs> so I'm Julie Cates, and my company is Tour Mappers North America, and we are an international inbound uh, operator, a receptive operator, as some people call them. We sell the U.S. Um, to international tour operators, primarily from Europe, the U.K., Germany. Um, the Netherlands, Switzerland, all across Europe is our primary market, although we do uh, have some business coming from Australia, New Zealand. Um, and we love selling all parts of the U.S. And we're based in Boston. Love it. Right you. now I'm in Brookline in my home. <laughs> love it. Thank you for being here and taking the time to, uh, to tune in today. We're going to go down to Elaine. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be here. 
Um, Brilliant Adventures is a wholesale tour operator. Um, it's kind of a one-stop shop for tour planners, group leaders who uh, want to offer a retail program and um, don't know an area or just want somebody else to do all the work. Um, so we uh, create customized and uh, private label tours for the entire U.S. and Canada. And um, we were with some great folks like uh, Lauren Gertie at Wearables Bus Service. <laughs> so, I, um, I didn't even know that. I love how this comes together. I love this industry for that uh, Yep, we're, they worked together for years. Yes. So um, we uh, are located in St. Simons Island, Georgia. And uh, earlier this year, we have uh, extended to Michigan. So um, that's our story. Nice. We love to make adventures for adventurous people. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for being here. Um, and Lauren, tell us about you. I didn't even know you guys worked together. I love how this, how this like. It, it's a smaller world than you might think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I see a lot of familiar names coming in to the chat. So hello, I miss you all a lot. Um, can't wait to see you all at the next trade show for sure. Um, but for those of you I have not met, my name is Lauren Grody. I am with Rails Bus Service. We are located in Westminster, Maryland, and um, it is a family owned and operated uh, school bus and motor coach business. Um, we have vehicles of both, and um, I am proud to be part of the third generation of the family. And um, it's an honor, first of all, to be with you all today. We we do ev a little bit of everything. So we provide not just regular um, school bus transportation for our local public school system, but we do um, a wide variety of items such as uh, large event shuttles and airport cruise terminal transfers, tour packages, field trips, athletic transportation, um, the list goes on. So anything you can do with a bus, we're, we're there to help do it. Um, today, I'm going to be more speaking on the motor coach end um, because we do package tours. We offer our own retail trips, which um, are very successful in our area, a wide range of day and overnight <laughs> trips. And then we also um, package together ch for charter groups such as senior centers, social organizations, um, churches, et cetera, we package tours together for them and do both day and overnight. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm, you know, I'm sure that as, as we talk about things, as we get into conversations, um, everyone is, is working in a variety of markets. Um, so I think our three panelists today are really going to provide a lot of insight as to what they're hearing and seeing from their clients and, and what we can expect um, moving forward. Um, so really, I think um, the first question that everybody wants to know um, is consumer sentiment and what you're hearing from your clients. So that's generally always a good place to start. You know, um, do you have any 2020 trips on the books? Do you think you're going to go at the end of the year or is everything 2021? And if so, when in 2021? That's the question now is kind of when we think it might pick up there. So Elaine, what are you hearing from your clients? Well, um, we still have a few trips on the books left for 2020. Um, we just operated a mystery tour last week for a motor coach operator out of Wisconsin. And, um, you know, originally that bus was pretty full. Um, when it all came down to day of departure, we had 14 people plus the tour director and the driver. Um, it went well. Everybody had a great time. Um, the challenge, uh, I have another group planned for Charleston Savannah. Right now they have 12 people and they are committed to go. But now um, I, my whole itinerary is, is changing because of availability. Um, because like people like the Spirit Line Cruises in Charleston aren't doing dinner cruises every day like they normally would. They're only going to do them on Fridays and Saturdays. Well, that's not typically when we put a group in Charleston. <laughs> and um, uh, people are changing their hours. So where that's not as much of a problem on a mystery trip, because I had to re completely redesign that trip 30 days out, um, that is kind of a problem on a retail program because you have truth in advertising. You have to let all the passengers know that, hey, this trip no longer looks the same. 
So I'm, you know, now I'm waiting to find out what all the changes are going to be on this itinerary. And so the question is, with all the new developments, will people want to cancel because they can't do a Charleston dinner cruise? They can't, you know, it just changes how you operate everything. And um, are you finding it difficult? I mean, and I think, I mean, this is a question that I think we'll all say yes to, but one thing that we've heard over and over again was it, it was hard to find a contact because so many of our friends and colleagues have been furloughed or, or new people have taken over that particular area. Um, so I, I'm assuming that that's probably one of the biggest challenges that you guys are facing right now. And I know that that our DMOs in all the different regions have tried really hard to keep up with what's going on and keeping contact out there. But I'm assuming that's probably one of the challenges for you. Well, it certainly is because sometimes you'll email a contact not knowing that they've been furloughed or, or no, they're no longer there. And if you're lucky, you get a bounce back that says they're no longer there, but sometimes you don't. So out of sheer, you know, oh, I haven't heard from this person and I've emailed them a couple of times, you have to pick up the phone and, you know, and find out who can you talk to or who is taking over that responsibility. Um, I mean, you know, we, we get there um, and most of the people that are in those positions understand that we're all working under these crazy conditions. Um, so for the most part, uh, you know, everyone's been great to work with. There are a few companies that, you know, don't seem to get that, you know, <laughs> it's not normal times and you can't keep my money and all of that. But um, for the most part, the majority of the people are all just wanting people to travel, you know, they're going to give us our group rates, whether we have 10 or 30. I mean, pe most people have been great. That's awesome. And it's nice to hear that you have some tours that are going out in 20. Um, that, I mean, that, that's really, that's really good to hear. It was the first one since February. So we went from having 120 tours on our books for this year to maybe we'll operate mm, seven. That's pretty so heartbreaking. I've seen those seven tours go out, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you keep those seven on the book. Well, we've already done four, so. <laughs> Lauren, what are you hearing from your clients? Um, so we transport, we package together trips for a lot of seniors and adult groups mostly. And right now we are starting to get more passengers interested in traveling. I think with in the bus industry, of course, it has it has been a, it's been a long haul for all of us. But in the bus industry, especially, um, it's been slow to get moving um, for obvious reasons. And uh, there's been a lot of challenges in regards to the transportation segment, but also with getting people to travel confidently. Um, I think that's important for us to get out to to people is that you can travel confident, confidently and safely. And that is what I put into all of the planning that I do. Um, so for instance, we have had five motor coach trips out um, in the past two months and they have just been local here in Maryland area, um, day trips, and we've had great responses. Um, on, our re on our retail trips, we are being responsible as a company and limiting our capacity on our buses to about 50% to create that social distance and have that way everyone feels comfortable riding and again creating that travel confidently message to them um, and of course we require masks while they're on board our on board the buses for safety reasons and then any place that we do take them i work with the each destination on what their protocols are and how we are working things on our end that way the destinations and our company were all on the same page and i can then go back to the customers with the final itinerary and information so that they know exactly what to expect along the way which i feel is important because no one wants surprises when they get when they get somewhere and the great part is 
that we're all learning this together. We, I think all of us in the industry can say we've made at least one mistake along the way um, through the pandemic and, and learning. Um, so it's been, it's been nice to be able to work with different destinations who have not been able to accept any groups yet this year. And we've been the first group to arrive at some of these destinations. So it's, it's fun to help help them think different challenges through of being able to accept groups um, and iron out all those wrinkles that come along with it. Um, so it's been, it has definitely been challenging, but I think people, there's a lot of pent up demand for travel. And I, a lot of folks, especially seniors are saying that they will be more apt to travel, especially longer distances once there is a vaccine. Um, but I think there's a lot of pent up demand and the floodgates are going to open for all of us. I, I do see light at the end of the tunnel, finally. Absolutely. There's pent up demand on my end for travel. I don't know about you ladies, but I am, I am ready to go someplace. Uh, so Julie, most of your clients are FIT international. Um, so, so what are, what are you hearing from them? Are they pent up and, uh, for demand and ready to travel? And and I'm assuming they're looking in 2021. Do you have um, do you have an idea of like when most of your requests have been on? And we have a lot of international travelers that are logging in. Stefano just logged in from Italy. So yes, uh, I see. Hi, Stefano. Um, yeah. Um, so obviously for this year, there has been pretty much zero revenue except for first what came in first quarter, which is generally a slower period. Um, uh, we are seeing, we, we're still contracting for next year, FIT, we're, we're contracting hotels and excursions and attractions, and we are getting bookings primarily from out of the UK right now, although we are getting smattering of bookings from other countries as well. And what I've heard is that once borders open, obviously uh, the bookings will start rolling in. There's most, you know, the Europeans and uh, uh, other uh, countries are so much more used to traveling than Americans and especially internationally, and they want to hit the road, so to speak. Um, I was speaking with one client yesterday in the UK who was saying they really do sense a great deal of pent up demand. Um, bookings had slowed down. A this is all for next year, of course. Um, bookings had slowed down last week a bit because the UK rolled back uh, their um, policies and are going uh, into a little bit more of a lockdown currently. So that has affected next year's bookings. People are kind of hesitating. Um, but yeah, once borders open, we anticipate um, uh, people to come, uh, hopefully in droves, but internationally, it probably will be a slower start. Plus the fact that the airlines have to, there has to be enough lift coming into the US and to all the gateway cities to accommodate um, the travelers. And uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a sticking point as well. So that has to be there. But Tour Mappers has been contracting hotels and uh, with getting connections uh, squared away. And so, we're, we're maintaining our operations as best we can, albeit with a much smaller staff, because obviously a uh, number have been furloughed. And it, it does make things a little bit difficult to keep up with all operations in a timely manner when you're down to a smaller staff. Absolutely. I think everyone, everyone um, can relate to that that's on this call right now. Yeah. Uh, it's nice that you're contracting. That makes everyone sit up and take, you know, a, 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 another glance at what's going on. It's always good to hear that. And, and specifically, we've had a question on who um, is a product manager for the West Coast or Colorado. Do you have anybody specific on that? Or are you taking care of that directly? 
um, they're curious on who to contact for new, would they have new? Well, right, <laughs> right now, um, it, they should, if they can call the office or email contracts at tourmappers.com. Contracts at tourmappers.com. And we'll make sure that that's in our follow-up email to this yeah. as well. Um, contracts, T-R. At tourmappers.com. Yes. So that was for Colorado. And right after I said that for Floyd, um, hi, Floyd, good to see you back on the call. Um, we had Miriam ask the same question about Philadelphia. So they can, they can absolutely both. Um, yeah, we have, yeah, we haven't, uh, <laughs> right now it's, everything's going into a central email and um, uh, we'll, we're sort of dividing up the work as can. Dividing and conquering, divided. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, a question from Francisco, um, and really when we were talking about hotels and contracting hotels and, and everyone being really great about working with rates, you know, for group sizes, he is really curious as to, you know, we're, our new normal is taking a deeper dive into um, e-channels, and he wants to know if you're seeing leniency from hotels alternating the static net rate agreement. So basically, are they working with you are they, are, you know, if your group sizes are smaller, as you mentioned, Elaine, you know, are you, are you, are hotels really working to, to keep that rate for you? Um, and he's curious as to how you're managing um, to, to a strong drive for dynamic rates. Is that for me? Or anyone, anyone can jump in. <laughs> you, you go ahead, Julie, you start first. Okay, well, I, I assumed it was for FIT, so. Um, so uh, as far as being flexible on, on rates, uh, the static rates uh, uh, that we're contracting, we've seen um, a good number of hotels uh, being more, uh, giving us better rates for next year. A lot have been close uh, to the same rate. Uh, very few have actually gone up a few dollars. We haven't seen a lot of rates go up for next year. Um, but we're connecting more and more hotels dynamically now. So obviously with dynamic rates, it's, it, it's how the hotels set it. And that makes it, um, uh, you know, easier to, to book. The cancellation terms obviously are more flexible and should be more flexible. Um, that's a that's a big point for our clients because people are especially if they're going to be traveling internationally. There was a big problem this year with people getting money back f uh, from the airlines and and uh, for their accommodation. So they want to know that if they book that they can get their money back should something happen. So I think the more flexible the cancellation terms are for everything, the more willing uh, people will be to book. Absolutely. And is that, is that the same for the group tours, Elaine and Lauren? Are you sensing the same thing? People wanting you know, that, that way to get out basically if, if they need to on cancellation? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we always ask for the most lenient cancellation terms we can possibly get and we push and we push and we push. Um, as far as rates are, um, most of the suppliers that we work with um, are giving us a lot of leniency on number of rooms to get that operator discount. Um, and um, a good friend of mine in the travel industry who owns a tour company uh, puts in his contracts that if the dynamic rate is lower than his booked rate that they have to give him the lower dynamic rate for the group. And uh, I think we're going to start putting that in our contracts too. Um, but, you know, I mean, I we mean, try to be fair. We try to be fair, but we have, especially us as a wholesale operator, we aren't getting money for trips that aren't running. So we can't afford to lose. We can't, have non-refundable deposits. We can't 
lose money. And really, I wish everyone would take attrition out of their tour and travel contracts. That's the worst thing in the world for us. We're not a convention. We don't have historic data to fall back on. We don't know if the trip's going to run. We try to communicate. We, we communicate as a company with our suppliers all the time as to whether or not we need to reduce rooms or whether or not we think that this tour is iffy. So it just is not the, it's not the same as a convention. We don't, so the terms should be different. I agree, I agree with Elaine. Um, yeah. <laughs> the attrition clauses in hotel contracts are very difficult um, for our type of operations. So I always try to negotiate those. Um, we are finding that what I'm trying to do is with any overnight trips that we had canceled for 2020, and I am trying to reschedule all of them for 21, um, because again, people want to get out and travel. It may, they may not be ready right now, but they, um, they're looking forward to next year. Um, and I try to relate to everyone that I work with that we're trying to keep our prices um, as comparable as possible to 2020 to encourage people to get out there and travel, to encourage them to re-sign up for those trips. And um, a lot of hotel properties have been workable. Um, there are a lot of properties that are willing to work with us. They get it. But then there are other properties um, more or less the luxurious type properties um, that offer those the luxury more luxurious experiences um, they can be a little bit more prone to not being so workable with rates so it's really across the board um, but flexibility right now is the key because um, for instance i had a trip going up north it was supposed to be going up north in, a, in two or three weeks and one of our overnight stays was in new york state well, Maryland, um, it, Maryland was on the quarantine list. I think we're off this week of New York's quarantine list. Um, but it was just too iffy to take that risk of keeping that hotel um, in New York, not knowing whether or not we were going to have to quarantine once we got there um, with the restrictions in place. So it's very tricky and flexibility is key right now for all of us in the industry. You know, I just, I just want to echo Elaine and Lauren's um, comments about attrition policies, because we also run group tours for our tour operator clients overseas. Um, we also have a division called American Experiences, which are our own um, uh, tours, and they're small group tours. Um, and so we never need more than um, eight or 10 rooms and, and it, because it's a maximum of uh, 13 people per, per tour. And so when we get contracts from hotels with attrition policies, it's just ridiculous. Um, and we see it so often. Um, we're not taking up half the hotel. <laughs> we're, we're taking up some rooms and plus we're reselling them. And so we're dependent upon our clients to sell those rooms. So basically, if a hotel is insistent, insistent upon an attrition policy, they don't get the booking. It goes somewhere else. So that, that's a that's uh, something. Now. And I will say, as, as we're on, we'll finish up the hotel conversation. But Floyd um, from Colorado Springs wants to make sure, just a, just a blanket statement that Remember, if you're having trouble to reach out to your DMO, they work with the hotels. They can't promise anything, but the DMOs will certainly run interference on your behalf if you need them to. So she just wanted to put that little caveat on there for <laughs> all of the lovely ladies. Um, and, and we do have another question that came in um, relating to hotels on deposits on groups for 2021. So I'm curious to know if hotels are asking for deposits on groups for 2021. Um, and if they are, are they refunding if it, they need to cancel due to COVID? I, I don't, you know, I think if they want to ask for a deposit, it should be, you know, 30, not more than 30 days in advance. But frankly, I know um, we have uh, heard from uh, one of our big clients overseas that they have uh, a mandate 
that they will not pay. Um, this is for FIT, really, but so group is, is a little different, but they cannot pay up front um, for any bookings. So, uh, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Nobody's going to be paying far out or leaving hefty deposits far out, not knowing uh, the state of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and on the same note, you know, not just hotels. Nobody has money to leave deposits far out. <laughs> Very true. We'll there. Um, Very true. But uh, Maria from New Orleans has a quick question. You know, mainly, you know, suppliers in general, not just hotels. I'm curious as if they're being upfront with the services that are available to you or limited services, or in, in some instances, are you seeing that arise on arrival? Like, are you getting hit with stuff when you just get there, or or is everyone doing a great job of keeping you informed ahead of time? Well, we we haven't had a lot of groups. <laughs> nobody's gotten anywhere. Sorry, nobody's got a lot of groups on the road. And since you, I mean, if you do have a group that's going out, we're making sure that we talk to all of those suppliers and getting every nitty gritty detail in advance of arrival. So we haven't had any surprises, but after dotting every I and crossing every T 16 times, we were to get a surprise of on arrival for not a good reason, that would not be good. We would not be happy. Very true. <laughs> what about you, Lauren? I mean, you've had some groups go out as well. Um, I'm the same way as Elaine. I ask, I think, every single question I even at night when I'm trying to go to sleep, I think of questions that I want to ask destinations. Um, but I just try to do the same thing, be as thorough as possible, ask any single question um, that could possibly arise uh, regarding a trip. And I think that's just the best way. It, it does take more time, but you, we can't expect anything to be normal during this time. Um, we have to expect the unexpected and be prepared for that. So I, my, my motto is always have a plan B. So I try to do that as well with trips. Perfect. Now I'm going to, I'm going to stay with you, Lauren, because we've had a question that's absolutely perfect for you. For those okay. of you who don't know, Lauren's been doing a lot of work with congressional leaders and ABA to, to make sure the motor coach industry is taken care of um, and has some relief that's coming through um, this pandemic. So one of the questions from Melissa, uh, she's been specifically asked to look into state regulations for motor coaches with regards to social distancing, face masks, you know, state to state, um, basically what's opposed to what is recommended and what's at the discretion of the coach company. She hasn't been able to find any one place that those all are. Do you have any suggestions for her? Does, is ABA, are you guys keeping track of that? Uh, yes. Um, so there is currently no federal mandate um, as to having to keep your passengers socially distanced or wearing masks. There is no federal mandate across the board. Um, I think that's going to be very hard for them to do. Um, so it pretty much goes state by state. Um, I know here in Maryland, uh, we are required to wear masks. Um, per our governor, that is really the only requirement here in Maryland on our motor coaches. Um, so, but as a company, um, we are limiting capacity just because that's what's recommended by the CDC. Um, however, any charter groups, um, we allow them to take as many folks as they feel comfortable with. So if they want to put 56 people on a 56 passenger bus, um, they can, they can do that. And there is no mandate against that. Um, I think it's, it's, basically just trying to find that happy medium because each group is different. You may have family reunions that they don't care. They don't want to be socially distanced. And then you may have 40 strangers on a bus that want to keep their distance. So I think it's really just finding that happy medium between groups. But to answer her question, no, there is no federal mandate. So sell, sell, sell. Perfect. Um, and we're going to stay on the topic of ABA real quick because Liz has sent in a question. They just announced they moved their dates to June, um, which which we knew that we knew Pete and Heat and Company were thinking about and, and moving it later in in the year for 2021. Um, so Liz's question is, how do you feel about the new dates, and will she see you in Baltimore? And that's for everybody. Yes. 
definitely. Yeah. I have been waiting for this ABA for several years now. Um, I, while I am disappointed that it won't be as scheduled in January because that is a much slower time for most of us in the industry, um, we'll make June work. It'll be warmer. Um, there'll be more things to do here in Baltimore, but I'm so close. I'm only 30 minutes away and I can't wait to welcome everyone to Maryland. That's great. We plan on being there. Awesome. <clears throat> so Liz also has a question about um, attractions. Um, and if, you know, when you have a FITs, um, certainly Julie, they, they're in their family group when they're heading into attractions, but specifically for groups, um, do you see, you know, are the groups splitting up, you know, when they go into an attraction for social distancing amongst themselves, or are you finding it a challenge when you're going into attractions? Some have timed entry, some don't have timed entry. I mean, how are you working with them, with groups that you have going out right now or in the future? I'll let you go. Go, sure. Elaine. It's all you. Me? Yeah. Um, well, just going off of what happened recently and I mean, typically when you're bringing a group to an attraction, you've kind of got a timed entry anyway. You're on, an, you're on a schedule, you know, I mean, so you, you have a specific time that you want to be places. Um, it all really depends on the nature of the attraction or the venue, um, whether it's self-guided or guided. If it's self-guided, then people are going to kind of disperse in their own little, you know, groups within themselves. Um, they're not going to move about as a group of 20 or 30. Um, what I think is happening right now is that if the group is were to be a little bit larger, they're going to get uh, two docents, if you can get docents, um, and break the group up into smaller uh, groups of 10, preferably 10 or 12. Um, it, it, you know, it's an issue, um, not everywhere that had docents previously are offering guided tours now because those docents tend to be on the older side and the docents themselves aren't comfortable working right now. Um, so everything is different um, and it all just really depends on the environment and, uh, but I mean, group travel as a, as a whole, typically we treat everything as a timed entry. We're always on a specific time. That's a really, that's a great point. I and mean, you know, when it comes to group travel, you're always, you're timed and you have an itinerary you're following. Julie, are you finding with FITs that it's a challenge? Well, we don't have FITs this year. <laughs> okay, good point. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that the attractions and excursions um, obviously have to, uh, and I'm sure many of them do already have uh, guidelines, health and safety guidelines um, where they are uh, separating people out who are going through in a, a museum or, or if it's a whale watch, perhaps they're going to be taking half the number of people they normally would. So um, we would obviously um, need to adhere to those, but we, whether it's for FIT or group, we need to know those guidelines for the attractions and the excursions. And um, we have to notify our clients um, uh, what these new guidelines are. And so if people are gonna be, you know, uh, taking the COG railway to the summit of Mount Washington, uh, you know, they, they want to know perhaps that they're not going to be sitting next to um, strangers, that there's going to be so many seats in between them. Um, and these are things that the attractions and excursions have to let us know uh, so that we can incorporate it into our, put it in our system and we're apprised so we can apprise our clients. And that's a really good point. And, and you know, we've had some questions about restaurants. Um, and I, I think we would all feel the same way about restaurants and um, are you looking more for private spaces now for restaurants where you can socially distance or, or you know, obviously, you know, you're going to need all of the restrictions that restaurants have, but does that change group dining at all in the way you look at group dining, Lauren? Yes. 
um, restaurants have been a challenge, um, as well as the guided tours. Um, just to backtrack a quick second, uh, instead of doing got so many guided tours included in our in our packages, I'm do I'm including more self guided visits. That way, they are not because, like Elaine said, with the docents, a lot of them are volunteers and um, are older, so they're does seem to be a decrease in the amount of docents available for um, group tours at museums and, so, and attractions. Um, so right now, I think people are a little bit more comfortable with doing self-guided visits or uh, smaller guided tours, like 10 or under, which a lot of the, a lot of the attractions and museums are offering. Um, in regards to restaurants, Yes, that is definitely something that is challenging right, right now. Um, I am doing a little bit of both, whether we take someone to a, take folks to a destination and give them time on their own to get to get their dining or um, include an incentive like a voucher, a meal voucher or something so that they can go on their own and they're not in a group setting, so per se, um, and can pick, choose their own seating. Uh, but I've also had a couple instances where we do have included group meals. And I, again, I try to work with the restaurants to figure out the seating. Um, if I have a party of six in our tour, then obviously that party of six can sit together um, or we'll, we'll try to break it up into smaller tables like twos and fours versus sitting at real long tables with 20 people at a table. Um, so again, just finding that happy medium uh, with people's comfort level. We typically always, even if we're working off of a group menu and the meals in included, we prefer that our that the group is sat in normal dining configurations. We hardly ever, unless the group specifies it, ask for them to ought to be sat in long, big tables. Um, whether or not it's private space, right now that seems to be an issue because a lot of states or, or different regions have very strict uh, guidelines on what they will allow as a group. So if we let people into the restaurant in seats of four to sixes as normal, and then just give them that group menu to order from so that it can be included, um, it doesn't look like a group per se, even though it is. So we want people to have as much of a normal dining experience as possible so that they feel like they're getting a local experience. Absolutely. Sheila, how are you working with restaurants? Um, well, for the group business, um, it's, it's basically what our clients want. And every, every um, tour operator client has a different way of how they like to handle it. And it, it depends on the restaurants as well. So that's, that, that really depends on, uh, on the specific group. Got it. Um, so this is, you know, this is a, Lori was reading my mind when she asked this question. Um, it is for everyone. Um, so are you, when you're talking with your clients and, and they're requesting destinations for 2021, um, are you seeing a difference in, in what they normally request? Are you seeing um, destinations beyond the gateway, more open destinations, tertiary destinations? Are you seeing a change in, in that normal request that, that you would have gotten years, you know, for the last year per se? For, for us on the FIT side, I mean, our, uh, we, we focus on selling destinations outside of the big cities. We, we do obviously sell city product, but um, our main focus and what we sell the most of are secondary destinations, um, fly drive, self-drive destinations. So if that's what people are wanting, that's better for us. We're happy for that. So we don't really see, um, wouldn't see a difference um, because that is what, what we focus on selling. Fabulous. Elaine, what about you? Are you seeing a difference in what people are requesting? Not, not a huge difference. I mean, we've, we kind of do a, a little bit of everything because of the way our, you know, our clients dictate where they want to go most of the time. 
um, we get asked for new ideas and we are, I mean, me, myself, I'm kind of focusing more on off the beaten path type of things. Cause I just think that that's going to be easier um, and a better experience for the near future. Um, I've had clients request information on a couple different festivals. And then after they sat back and thought about it, they are leery of booking any large scale events for next year. First of all, there's too much uncertainty under what, what is it even going to happen? But I still think that people are a little leery about being in like large groups. So like really large groups. So um, I think um, more off the beaten path, um, as long as weather permits, I, I'm looking for more outside activities, um, places that are large scale so that people can really spread out. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's still the tried and true. As much as people ask for something different, what sells is basically sometimes the same things that they've been doing. So right. you know, they put out a new product and it doesn't sell. And I absolutely understood. I'm going to get back to that statement in just a minute. But uh, Lauren, um, what about what about requests that you're seeing? Any big changes here? We're not seeing too many big changes. Um, unfortunately, the one trend that I am noticing is not as many requests for the big cities. Um, it breaks my heart because I love the big cities too, um, but I understand also, and it does, the larger cities are coming back a little slower um, than other areas with restrictions and reopenings. So it is a little bit more difficult with the larger cities. Um, but again, things that are selling for us are more remote and rural areas, um, train rides and um, activities on your own more or less than group focused tours. They're really more self-guided type tours, more yes. free time. Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I knew this was going to happen. It's like we have 13 minutes and we haven't even talked about marketing yet. So um, I'm going to get back to what you just said, Elaine, for, uh, you know, the point of what sells and what they request. So when, what kind of marketing are you doing right now? You know, what, um, if, if any, you know, what, is it time to market? What are you doing in, in, in terms of marketing to your clients? And what can our attendees on this call help you with? How can they, you know, have a great destination that is new and different and off the beaten path and help you promote it? Um, I'll go first. Yeah. I mean, it, so it's different for us. We're not marketing to the individual people that would be signing up for a trip. Um, tour operators that are doing retail programs absolutely should be marketing right now. Um, another, a different friend of mine in uh, the travel industry who owns a tour company said that you want to be visible. You want people to know that you're here, ready, you're planning travel for the future. You want them to be the ones that when they're ready to travel, they're going to sign up with you because they've seen, consistently seen you out there. Um, we're a little different. I mean, I've kind of been all over the place. Um, I, I, I try to reach out to my clients, let them know that we're here, that we're ready to plan for them. Um, and uh, it's different for everyone. I mean, I've got some people that are plan, 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 plan. And then I've got some people that, that are just kind of sitting back. They want to wait and see, They're trying to get, you know, their temperature reading and all of that. Um, but certainly if I were a retail operator, I would be consistently uh, marketing. Understood. And Lauren, how about, what does marketing look like for you right now? So right now we have had to put our print marketing on hold. Um, usually we send out several uh, pamphlets of, um, per se, to our, to our retail passengers. However, due to the cost and um, lit very little income coming in since March, um, kind of have to figure out other marketing strategies right now. So uh, we have been advertising, of course, on our Facebook page, Instagram, and uh, our, 
our email blast out to our customers and of course our website. And um, a lot, honestly, is word of mouth too. Um, we do have a lot of seniors that rely on getting our printed materials, um, but we're finding that even those seniors are finding out from other folks in the community, oh, Rails is a backup and running. And I mean, we never stopped, but they thought we did. Um, but, uh, you know, th so it's, it's interesting. It's just different. We will be sending out more printed materials in November so that to get people ready for 21. Um, but, it, you know, just taking some different approaches. But like Elaine said, you have you have to market to them. You have to market to these individuals and let them know you're there and ready when they are. I think um, I think everyone, all of our attendees in general and um, we run events. I'm, I'm same with us is we've taken a step back to look at what we can do digitally. Um, and how that reach, you know, can, can get out there with everyone um, and trying to be creative in, in the way that we do things. And, and Julie, I'm, I'm sure you're the same as, as, you know, what you're doing, marketing, you know, to your clients internationally. Um, is it mostly digital? It is. It, right now, it's solely digital. The only time we publish um, our catalogs is for trade shows. We basically have done it twice a year. Uh, for IPW in the spring, and then we do update it uh, for World Travel Market. But seeing as we're not seeing anybody this year, um, it's digital, and and uh, the updating of the catalogs, even online, um, has been pushed aside. We do an email blast every couple of weeks called What's New Wednesday, where we feature newly contracted properties or excursions in different destinations. Um, and uh, we try to be creative uh, with different things at different times. When the pandemic first hit and everybody was at home, we just wanted everybody to know that, you know, we're still alive and breathing. We, you know, nobody's buying anything. We know that. And it wasn't people's focus at the time. But what we did was uh, in a um, our What's New Wednesday, instead of sending out real properties, we, we sort of um, <laughs> used our own living, uh, uh, our own homes uh, as inns and, and, and told people um, like we were guests at our own inn, just to be fun and creative and let people sure. know we were, you know, we're around, uh, you know, we're, we're still going. So, um, so yeah, so our, our published materials are, are uh, not there, but digitally we, we try to keep in touch with, with them. But as I said, it is hard when you don't have a full staff. <laughs> Absolutely. So I know that um, one thing that, that a, lot of the, a lot of the suppliers and, and all of our, our attendees on this particular webinar have been doing are putting together um, snippet videos of new and off the beaten path kind of things, you know, in their destination and, um, and certainly putting those out there. And if they could work with you on that, you know, on some of the videos they've created that you could put on your social channels, you know, maybe that's something that's new and different that, that you could do to push some of those itineraries that you're looking at for 2021. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that they will all be in touch with you after this, after this webinar. So, so that is just your FYI you're gonna get some of that information. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. Um, and a couple of questions that, that I have for you that generally is, is really uh, all of our attendees are curious on is, you know, after, we, after things like this in the past, and we've never experienced, you know, this type of pandemic in our industry, but after 9-11, after um, natural disasters that have happened and we've had to come back from, you know, and, Travelers were savvy, and they were looking for deals. Uh, you know, is this something that um, that that you're hearing from your clients right now? I mean, are they looking for the lowest rate, the best deal, the buy one get one opportunity? And and if so, if those types of enticements are important to your clients, what's the one that normally um, makes them book? What's what's the deciding factor? Elaine, are you seeing that? Not really. I mean, uh, first of all, every everyone in the tourism industry has been hurt. So their ability to discount and do 
buy one, get ones and all of that. I mean, consciously, if you're really thinking about that, how do you ask people who have been operating under capacity in these drastic times to give you something that they don't have? I mean, I, I have a hard time with that. Secondly, if, if people want to, that are, are worried about group sizes and things like that, and they want a little bit of distance, then they're gonna actually have to spend more money because uh, a certain costs like a motor coach uh, and all of that are, you know, a tour director, those are fixed costs. And there's a big difference between whether you're dividing that by 15 people or whether you're dividing that by 50 people. So if you want 20 people on a motor coach on a trip that normally would have been based on 35 or 40, the price is going to go up, not down. And I would hope that people whose incomes haven't been affected that are traveling will understand that they are going to travel because they love to travel and because they don't want to see the travel industry die. Very Quite well honestly. said. Very well said. We had a we had an operator on our call last week that 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 said similar similar things, but basically the gist of it was let's protect our industry and the and the integrity of our product. Uh, but Lauren, what are, are what are you hearing? I absolutely agree with Elaine. Um, we have all taken a huge toll this year, um, just unprecedented for all of us. I mean, who would have thought that travel would slow up, <laughs> especially here in the U.S.? Um, I would feel terrible asking um, a location for a discount or a special buy one, get one free or anything like that right now, because again, we've all just been hit so hard. Um, we know that things are going to go up. We all, none of us can afford to undercut ourselves. Um, so all we can do is, and all that I ask from suppliers is, you know, keep the 2020 pricing if at all possible to entice people to travel for 21. I don't expect any freebies. I don't expect, you know, any further discounts because the industry is already um, very good to us, you know, providing group discounts in versus individual rates. So, um, I mean, the travelers are already getting a great deal um, for their dollar. So, um, I'm not looking for any type of extra incentives like that. Awesome. And you Julie, know, from, what about, what are your clients saying? Yeah, from the group perspective, I, I know what Lauren and Elaine are saying. Um, for FITs though, they the bottom line is rate. And um, if they are looking at two, ho you know, you have to consider that many, uh, a lot of uh, people have had their incomes cut <laughs> and have been making less money. Um, Europeans still want to travel though, but they'll be looking for the best deal. And things like uh, stay, pay to stay three nights isn't really valid for FIT travelers because uh, they're here for two weeks. They're often traveling um, throughout a region, and they're going to be just staying one or two nights in each destination and moving on. So um, uh, promotions such as that, you know, stay four, pay three, or something similar, don't always work. The bottom line comes down to rate and what your competitor down the street <laughs> is giving. Um, and obviously, we all uh, need to make up money uh, when this is all over, but um, uh, people want to travel and, and some cannot afford to pay what what they used to be able Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think those, those rate conscious travelers will always exist in, in what we do. Uh, yes, Elaine, you don't even have to raise your hand. You can just... <laughs> <laughs> well, I just did want to say, though, uh, that while we're trying to figure out what's going to be the best group size for until things go back to what we hope will be the old normal um, is that you give tour operators the group rate that we've always had no matter how many people we bring you 
because that will that will help us. We're not asking for extra discounts, but if if your minimum used to be 20 and we only have 10, 12, 15, please still give us the group rate. Perfect. Um, so this is this is when I generally say, hey, you know, what kind of what kind of uh, inspiration can you give us? You know, what uh, look in your crystal ball and do you have any last thoughts? You know, we we're two o'clock. I told you this would go fast, and we've run through all of our time. So so let's finish with some with some last thoughts or any inspirational words you might have for everyone on the call. Julie, what are you thinking? Mm. <laughs> Vote early. <laughs> and it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Yeah, we we have we have some things on the books in twenty one, <laughs> for sure. Lauren, what do you think? I think we all need to try to stay positive in a negative world right now. Um, we've been dealing with so many struggles along the way, and I find that just staying positive, trying to stay as positive as possible, and knowing that this, just like anything else, will end too. We will see that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it, brighter days are ahead, and I am hoping and praying that 21 is brighter for all of us, but in the meantime, I will say that the support of this awesome industry has, and I don't want to start getting emotional, but that is what has helped get us through. Um, just the support from all of the suppliers and other bus companies and industry friends, um, just checking in, even if we can't do business with one, one another right now, just knowing that we're all there to support each other is very crucial at these times. And especially to our industry friends who are going through transitions um, with their destinations and employers, um, we just really need to be there for everyone right now. Very well said. Elaine, any last minute thoughts? Well, my friend Jay Smith sent uh, a bunch of us um, in a little network a uh, link to a video for, from a speaker named Willie Jolly. And the biggest takeaway I got from that, which I really needed today, was you may not be responsible for being knocked down, but you are responsible for getting back up. So take responsibility. Absolutely. I love and it. And every day is a good day for a good day. You are right. Very well said. Um, so with, on that note, we're going we're gonna to wrap up today. Um, I've kept you over. I promised you I wouldn't, but I've kept you over. Um, ladies, Julie, Lauren, Elaine, thank you for taking time with us today and answering our attendees' questions and giving them a glimpse of what's going on in your world so they can plan for theirs a little bit better. Um, and, and Lauren said it best, we are all in this together. We're going to get through it together. We're going to support each other, know that we're here for each other. Um, so I really appreciate all three of you taking the time. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing everyone, it. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Everyone on the call, um, thank you for tuning in again, um, and continuing to tune in with us week after week. Um, quick announcement for next week, the 1st of October, we are not going to do a webinar. Um, and that's because it's the very first day of our virtual e-tourism conference. Um, so every day in the month of October, um, we will be doing um, a webinar with um, regarding social media, digital media, what's new in the realm. Um, generally a show we do in person every year. It's a hybrid this year, so it will be virtual. Um, every day in October, as well as an in-person um, event, November 8th through the 10th, when we're doing our tour and RTO shows. Um, so we will not have a webinar next week, but we're coming back strong on October 8th, where we will have an hour dedicated to Expedia, um, kind of some uh, learning a little bit of their data, what they're seeing um, as far as the new um, domestic traveler um, in the U.S. Um, and get some ideas of how we can work with them and kind of dig into their research a little bit. Um, so with that, thank you so much for being on the call. Um, and I will see you guys back here in two weeks. Have a great weekend, everyone. Talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.